Welcome to the Data Bytes podcast, brought to you by Women in Data. My name is Sadie St. Lawrence, and it's my pleasure to be your host for these weekly interviews where we share inspiring stories, thought leaderships, and discussions to help you excel in your data career. At Women in Data, our mission is to increase diversity in data careers, and we do this through awareness, education, and empowerment. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with the tenacious and inspiring Reagan Avon, co-founder and CEO of Align AI, where she is changing the way companies retain, update, and consume their institutional knowledge around building and using data and AI. In today's episode, we chat about her founder's journey, the struggles and solutions that exist with sharing institutional knowledge for AI, and how to overcome barriers as a woman in tech. I think you'll be inspired by her story and find much relatable insights into how we share and gain institutional knowledge. Enjoy. Regan, welcome to the Data Bytes podcast. So happy to have you here today. How's your day been? It's so good. I just got back from vacation, so my brain is still like kind of turning on again, <laughs> but it's so lovely. It was great to have a break and... I'm super excited to be on the show. Yeah, I totally get that brain turning back on after vacation. And that's what I'm so happy that I document and write things down. Because if I had a great vacation and it was like long enough where I stopped thinking about work, I'd come back and I'm like, wait, what was I doing? And what was I worried about? And what should I be focused on? And I'm like, okay, thank God I wrote everything down prior to leaving. Because it takes a few days to like get your brain back in that boat. It 100% does, especially if I've been trying to be more conscious about checking out of work when I'm on vacation. Like I turn off my notifications on my phone because I know I'll just like go right back to it. And, you know, we all try to do it when time is slow, but like it's been crazy over the last couple of days. So it was actually insane timing to go on vacation, but you know, it's never good. (laughs) Yeah, I know, but it's always worth it for sure. So I'm so happy we get to have this deeper conversation because we finally had the opportunity to meet in person at ODSC West this year. And that was such a pleasure. And I was like, okay, we got to talk more in detail on the podcast in terms of what you're doing and how you got started because you're doing some really exciting things. So tell us a little bit more about your story. Like what first got you interested in data and analytics? Yeah, and I echo that too. I it's so funny we've been following each other online and finally got to meet in person. I was so 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 excited when I saw you were speaking. So um, I'm really glad we got to connect there. Um, my background is in engineering. I went to Ohio State uh, and studied industrial systems engineering. At the time, there was kind of a um, initiative by the the university to support more data and analytics and data science curriculum. And they were launching a specialization in my major uh, for data and analytics. And it was essentially a computer science minor, uh, basically. And it it focused on data mining and a couple of other fundamentals in, in CSE, which I think was great and provided me with a lot of the essentials that I needed. But there were two elements that got me interested in it. One, I was absolutely obsessed when I took my first programming class in college. It was the first time I was introduced to programming and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And the second was like almost accidental. I'm like hyper competitive. And when the um, specialization came out, they're like only 10 people in your major get to be in the specialization. And I was like, ooh, I should apply for that and just see if I can get in. And it was heavy on math and heavy on CSE and both things that I was super passionate about and, you know, didn't really understand a lot of the career opportunities that came with that. And so I kind of got lucky in in the fact that I got in and I got, you know, introduced to this field so early and just couldn't stop obsessing over it. I went down all these like YouTube rabbit holes Uh, like almost 10 years ago now. But yeah, that's how I got into it. And then I just kept, you know, doubling down because it was it quickly became a passion of mine. Yeah, what's amazing is I'm, I'm always surprised how many people 
didn't get exposed to coding until college, right? And especially in a world where it's like a digital world that we live in today, it's kind of like the backbone of our whole economy and businesses. And we go all the way through like early education and high school and never even getting exposed to some of these deeper concepts. So when you do get exposed, yes, you count yourself as the lucky few. And I love that you say you're a little bit competitive and that's motivation because I don't know if you've ever taken Strengths Finder, but I did once and one of my strengths was competition, which I was like, oh, I knew I was competitive, but I didn't know it was so much where it was a strength. And I never knew how to put that in terms of a strength. And so I love that you shared that like, hey, part of it was like, it's a high selection rate and that's what made you go after it, which I think is great. Like, I think it's just, you know, share so much of like your personality and who you are and how that can be used to as an advantage. So you got exposed to this, you were obsessed, dived in more and have taught classes. You started women in analytics. You definitely are someone I look at as a founder and entrepreneur to their core. And today you're now a co-founder of Align AI. Where did the inspiration for your new venture come from and what are you doing at Align? Yeah, I um, also got exposed to the startup world in college as an intern. And uh, again, uh, I guess I just have an obsessive personality, <laughs> quickly became obsessed with that too. And my dad's also an entrepreneur. So I was exposed to kind of entrepreneurship as a, as a kid um, growing up as well, which I feel fortunate to have been exposed to that. Um, and just with my competitive personality, I think that's just something that um, I naturally fell into. But the premise, I always talk about this too, because there are some people who just want to be an entrepreneur and they're looking for a problem to solve. And there are other people who find problems to solve and find themselves as an entrepreneur. And mine was definitely the latter. Like, even though I was kind of obsessed with the startup idea and um, had worked at a bunch of startups, I actually never thought I would go on to kind of start my own thing. Um, I always found it a lot more fun to support other people doing that because it looked like it was really hard. <laughs> so I, you know, ended up working at a startup uh, with one of, one of my co-founders, Brendan, um, called Model Op. And we worked at a ton of uh, companies that were our customers in highly regulated industries like financial services, insurance, uh, basically helping them deploy machine learning models at scale. So a lot of these banks were developing lots of models. They were built locally on, you know, data scientists, computers, and then they were having a hard time figuring out all of the elements of productionalizing those models and how to manage risk and make sure that they had, you know, elements of auditability and lineage and all of the metadata around models. And so the tool we were building helped them do that. And this was back in like 2016, 2017. And in that whole process, you know, I was a solutions architect. Um, Brendan was also heavily involved in the implementation process, kind of field engineering. And we would build kind of these brilliant, you know, architectural um, solutions for these companies and show them and demonstrate the technology. But the problem was always at the, the, the process, the lack of process that existed. And Brendan has a really good saying that says, um, you know, technology is a manifestation of process, right? It helps us automate things. It helps us like take something that exists and make it faster, easier, you know, um, more audited, more, um, automated in general. And so he, he and I kept like reminiscing over some of the challenges that we were experiencing. And we were like, well, what if we tried to solve the people process issue or challenge instead of the technology challenge? Cause the technology was there. And so this is when we dove into this idea around the line AI, which was, you know, what are some of the fundamental issues companies are having with change management as they're going through these evolutions of their technology to become data-driven and use AI uh, inside of their organization to provide value. And so that's the premise of Align AI was to try to solve that problem. Incredible. I love that saying um, technology is a function of process because I've seen so many times that 
people look to a tool to solve their problem. And I'm like, the tool is not going to solve your problem. It's either going to amplify the problem you have already. <laughs> but I didn't have the right words. And that phrase just puts it perfectly into perspective, right? Of like, yes, it is a huge asset in terms of automating things. But if you don't have that process set up from the beginning, like it's that implementation is not going to go well and you're going to probably amplify what you don't want to amplify. So I think that is such a good call out. And I love, you know, the comparison you take in terms of the two different types of founders, one who just are at their core and, you know, look for a problem and then others who see a problem and then essentially become founders by happenstance. So I love how you identified the institutional knowledge that you shared and how tooling wasn't getting us there for what we needed to have that AI implementation at scale. So when you think about institutional knowledge, like how do you quantify this? Because I think this is something we all know exists and probably the people who build the most are like, if you're a new hire coming into a company, right? And you are trying to get on board with the way people do things and you're like, I'm missing something, right? Because there's things that were written down or weren't written down in my onboarding that other people seem to understand that I'm not understanding. So how do you uncover that institutional knowledge, especially from places where people may have worked there for 10, 20 years and it's really all in their head? Yeah, this is the major, major issue we're seeing. And I don't love this phrase, but they call it the like hitting, getting hit by a bus, you know, situation where there's somebody who is like, like you said, has been at the company for a long time, knows all kind of knows where everything sits, knows where all the bodies are, knows all the nooks and crannies of every system, you know, knows all of the language the company has developed over time. Um, understands the nuances behind the data, understands where it's stored. And I think we've seen kind of this issue bloom over the last maybe like five to 10 years around some of these systems because people have been responsible for setting that up themselves, which is great. However, you run into this problem where we're now in this massive movement of democratization in a ton of different avenues. One of them that we've seen pretty heavily in the industry is this whole data catalog element where you've got institutional knowledge and context around the data that's being collected and stored and is available now to people across the organization. And so you can look at institutional knowledge from that perspective, which is this data represents all of these systems that we have in place. And we're trying to understand what it means and understand how we can blend it together in a way that's meaningful. Um, there's also the institutional knowledge around process. So, you know, I put the data in here and then I um, provide context and metadata around it. And then you can access it through these different avenues. And, you know, once I do access it, here's how I can develop a model on top of that. And here's where I put it in GitHub. And, you know, all of these kind of procedural elements, which sometimes technology assists with, but oftentimes it doesn't. And so I think that process institutional knowledge around these like critical functions and standards um, around AI and, and data specifically is where we focus, you know, less so on the, the business context, although that's extraordinarily important, more so around how do we manage these elements as critical business assets of the company or the organization and manage it in a way that's meaningful and enable people across the organization to interface it with it efficiently. And so that's kind of how we define institutional knowledge is more on the procedural side. I love that. I actually, in our, our team stand up this morning, just a couple hours ago, someone's writing up a document and shared, oh, I'm finishing this document, you know, in case I get hit by a bus. I don't like that term either. We got to come up with a new term of like, I'm like, in case I win the lottery and my dreams come true or something, right? And I, But then I'm like, what? Your dream isn't to work here? I don't know. We'll work on a new term. But we all know it's, for some reason, it's the existing term in technology of like, hey, you need to document things and share your process in case you get hit by a bus. And so this is, I, I see it all the time. It's so relevant. And it's something I struggle with too, I think, 
being a founder, there's all these things that you do intuitively that are in your head and even pulling it out yourself and out of your own brain. So how do we get from that point of, okay, we know there is this institutional knowledge that exists in our organization, but how do we actually pull it out of our brain and store this so that it can be shared and distributed across the organization? Yeah, this is the number one catch-22 that companies are, or organizations are finding themselves in today because those people are also way over capacity in all of the other elements that they own, typically, because they are the key man, key woman at the organization. And so they, you know, they're tasked with two things. They're tasked with keeping the trains running on time. And they're also tasked with trying to download all of the stuff out of their brains so that they're not the only ones that are doing it. And so they're usually extraordinarily overwhelmed and the tools they have available to them are very challenging to use. So they don't have a lot of time to document. People don't love documenting either. It's really hard and also very time intensive um, because you have to think about the the reader. You have to think about the person who's going to take that information and use it in an effective manner. And that's really challenging too. So, you know, these, these open-ended tools like a Google Doc or SharePoint or Confluence or, you know, some of the newer ones like Coda or Notion, they're great for what they are. They're general documentation tools. And some of the newer ones are doing a really good job, in my opinion, creating templates for things so that you aren't starting from scratch because that's one of the hardest pieces. And so I think that's one of the daunting elements that is keeping people from spending time doing documentation is that it's its own thing. It's you're, you're mostly starting from scratch. So you're trying to think of all of these elements on what to include. And you're also not sure if what you're doing is comprehensive. And so that's, those are sort of the elements we're trying to bake into what we're doing because we're so nichely focused on the data and AI space. Like we can dive into a lot of those details and provide a lot of that information up front for people so that they're not starting from, you know, scratch. And, and the poor people that are trying to build stuff in PowerPoint too. <laughs> like <laughs> it's just, it's getting like the stuff we've seen to try to solve this problem inside of companies today is I just feel bad for those people who are just spending all of their time trying to make that work. Yeah. And I think you make two really good points. One is that the people who you need to essentially extract the information from their brain and put onto paper, right? They're usually the busiest people because they are keeping the lights on their essential component. And so also having that additional time is a struggle. And then I think it's a really good call out too that sometimes it's hard to document the process. Like when I go through it, I have to write something out, see what someone else does and look at their assumptions, right? Because again, we have so, because we also have that institutional knowledge in our brain, there may be pieces we're leaving out because it's intuitive to us. And so I think it's, what you're doing is so great of having somebody else come in and being able to pull that out because they can come in with a fresh lens to say, hey, this is what's missing. This doesn't really make sense. Are you sure this is all you do here? And ask those qualifying questions. So once you go through this process, what are some of the outcomes you've seen from being able to share that institutional knowledge? Yeah, and today we do a lot of hands-on um, elements like you just described, the platform we're building is meant to make this extraordinarily self-service. And so that is super exciting because that's a really wicked UX problem that we're trying to tackle, which I think is honestly really timely based on a lot of the AI tools that are coming out now that are just drastically increasing the user experience for tools that people are interfacing with. So I, I'm actually pretty excited about that element that we're building, but the kind of process that we go through today when we are more hands-on, I think what's nice is we're doing a couple of things. One, we're, we've got tons and tons of patterns across company sizes, company maturity, company industries, um, team dynamics. Um, so we've got all of these patterns that we're able to say, like, 
here's what works and here's what's unique about this industry or this particular stage of maturity. Um, so that's really fascinating, just getting kind of all of those patterns across people we've engaged with. Um, the second thing is all the industry best practices that are solidifying in the um, like with with thought leaders out there today. So people, you know, the standards are starting to solidify. I, I, I don't know that we can point to like specific playbooks for, you know, um, for like responsible use of AI, for example. There are good ones out there for sure. But I, I don't know that everybody agrees on all of the elements that need to be considered. So I think the solidif solidification of industry standards is actually really interesting and that's starting to get better. Um, and, you know, when we were at ODSC West, I was just like, shocked by how many ML ops companies <laughs> there are. So I feel like that that part of the industry is also advancing quite a bit, which is really fascinating. Um, and then I think the third element is every company is unique. And whether or not, you know, we like to generalize typically because it is more applicable to people. But the reality is, even if there's two banks, you know, you may have totally different systems set up, totally different processes set up internally. Um, you might be capturing data in a different way. You may have different quality challenges. Um, and so the reality of the situation is that there is a uniqueness element to each company when it comes to these standards. And I think AI is so interesting in that it exacerbates that uniqueness to an extent. Um, and so that, that those are kind of the three elements that we keep looking at is like, what's what's industry best practice? What are the patterns we're seeing? And then what is truly unique uh, company to company? I love that. I, you know, I think it's important to, to see both lenses, right? Of like, yes, each company is unique, but there is also things we can learn from others in our industry and there are industry best practices, right? So keeping a bit of that uniqueness and your culture and your own individuality and way of doing things, but yet also learning from others is really key. And so I'm super excited for what you're creating and building, and we're entering a new year in 2023, so I'm sure you have some, you know, wildly important goals at Align AI. What are you most excited for in 2023? Yeah, I'd say the last two years have been just a hyper-focus on market research and, and just getting our bearings and understanding, like, what are the true opportunities to go after here? Um, and what's our, our approach to solving this problem? I feel like we've been extremely thoughtful on how we, we want to approach the problem. Um, this year is a year of, of building and acceleration, which is just so cool. So seeing things come to life, like be real, you know? And, um, and I think that's a really fun phase of a company um, we're going to be doing a lot of growing this year, so our team size is going to increase quite a bit, uh, which is also really fun and exciting. Um, and so, you know, really digging our heels in and making sure that we are very, very, very close to all of our customers and we're building what's useful and what's going to be sustainable for them. And I think that's um, my favorite part. It's almost like you're like dropped in the middle of a forest in the beginning and you're like just trying to get your bearings, like figure out what you can eat, figure out what you're going to do uh, in terms of shelter. And so like now we're, we've got our bearings and we're, you know, starting to make a lot of really good progress on the build side. And so 2023 is definitely going to be the year um, that we'll see some really fun, exciting things come to life. Well, I'm excited to see what happens. And I love the analogy. It, it kind of gives me like survivor feel, right? Like first you got to set up your shelter and then you got to build some tools to forage for food. And so you're like, okay, we got the basics now. Now we're ready to like really accelerate and turn it on. So I'm looking forward to 2023 and, and what it brings for you and your team. So one of the things I really respect about you is just being a woman in technology and a founder, um, creating women in the analytics and founding it. But I'm curious, like, what are some of the biggest barriers you see women face in a technology career, whether that's, you know, personally yourself or what you've seen from the community of women in the analytics? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's unique to our space specifically, but I, I do feel like for a while, there's almost this perception of um, inclusion just to kind of like feel good about it. And you know what I mean? Like where people have said, yes, we need more women in this field. And, and so we're going to be inclusive because it makes us feel good. And I think that has helped accelerate some stuff. But at the same time, I think it's also put a interesting lens of women in the space as well. Like, I, I don't know if you've experienced this yourself, but there's almost kind of this like perception of a like cutesy piece of being a woman in, in tech or in AI and or in data. And it, it almost puts this like odd shield of um, where where people think women can go in this space. And uh, I've seen a lot of progress on that in the last like three to four years, honestly, which has been really, um, which has been really great. Cause every time, and the reason I, I say this is every time I would talk about women in analytics, and again, I don't, I don't know if your experiences are similar, but it would almost seem like, oh, that's cute. Like, oh, you're putting together a conference where there's women speakers. That's cute. And it was never like this like serious thing. Like people are like, yeah, that's a nice little cute inclusive community. And, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted the community to seem like, oh, wow, that's a really premier community for professionals in the data and analytics space, you know, and I want to be a part of that. And so I feel like we've been battling that a little bit. Um, and so yeah, we did a little bit of rebranding on some of those elements um, last year just to see if we can combat that. Um, and I think it's helped. So, but, but that's been the biggest thing that I think has been a challenge because also professionally you, you run into the same things. Like you're, you know, in the room and I've been, it's been assumed that I was the one going to grab everybody a coffee or order the lunch or you know, whatever. And, and you kind of have to be like, nope, I'm not going to do that, you know? And so that's kind of digging your heels in and, and truly being seen as an equal in strategic conversations and, you know, um, technical conversations. I just, it feels like you almost have to prove yourself a little bit more. Like I can go head to head with you technically if you want me to. <laughs> and that, that's hard. Um, and so I think just kind of being real about that, that's, you know, at least what I've experienced as, as a woman in this space. Yeah, I would completely agree. I think, you know, things like the Me Too movement brought a lot of awareness to women's equality in the workplace. And I think we're at an awareness state where, you know, no one, at least to my face and probably not to your face, would ever say, oh, I don't think this is important, right? So there is a verbal support of D-E-N-I. However, I think we've, we have still yet to see to move that from a verbal support into an actionable support. And that's where these feelings of it's kind of like, okay, we're going to let you play, but only in this little space over here. And, you know, you're at the table, but just because we needed a token at the table, right? And as individuals, as minorities, you can feel that, you know what that feels like when Yes, you may be at the table, but are you at the table equally with the same voice to be heard, with looked at and questioned for those same insights? And this is where we start to get into some of that unconscious bias, right? That it's really hard to pinpoint and share, but you're like, as someone in this space, you're like, I know this exists. I can feel it every single time I walk into the room. Explaining it to someone can be a little bit difficult. But I do believe we're at that, you know, the next frontier is, okay, how do we move this into not just verbal support, but to actionable support? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think an antidote on that too was, you know, like, I, I remember one of my jobs, and I won't be specific, but one of them, I created an org chart and I put, like, I broke everybody down by, um, you know, male, female, and they and then I showed it to like a C-level individual and I was like this is a problem <laughs> and if you continue down like your trajectory 
you're going to have a really hard time recruiting women to work here. And I remember him saying, like, well, if you can solve that problem, you're going to be really rich. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun answer. I mean, that's one of those of, like, you need to just hold up a mirror, right? In that situation, hold up a mirror. Problem solved. Can you see it? Uh, but we won't do that. We'll, we'll play a little bit nicer. So in terms of, you know, where you're at today, I always like to look into the future and then into the past. And you've had some amazing accomplishments in your life today. If you could take yourself right now and give your younger self a piece of advice or maybe an update on your life. Like what would, what would be that one piece of advice you would tell your younger self? Um, this is one that I reflect on a lot. Oftentimes when we are pushing ourselves past our limit of where we, you know, into that growth zone that feels super uncomfortable, um, it you often perceive individuals to be more ahead or more advanced than you, like in that arena, than they are. And that can be daunting. And actually, I think that's where a lot of imposter syndrome can, can stem from. And, and I just would tell my younger self that like, when you finally get comfortable in that uncomfortable zone, then you look around and you realize, okay, like I can't, I have the ability to do this. I just did it. And I can do it again. And it's kind of a rinse repeat. Like you can just keep going and keep working hard and, and keep, you know, pushing yourself further and further and further. And I think it's always daunting when you like stretch yourself a little bit and you're like, oh, there's that uncomfortable feeling again. But when you, as you look back and you get more reps at doing that, you're like, oh, okay. Like I've done it multiple times and you just have to remind yourself that it's just part of the process And man, it still hits me all the time today. So, but I felt like it was maybe a little bit more debilitating earlier in my career. Um, And so I just, I would probably give myself some perspective around that. Like it's going to keep happening. You're going to keep facing it. And it, there is another side to it. You just don't know what it is yet. And that's a little scary and, but that's okay. Yes, yes, yes. I love that getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. And you are so right. It is, it's like once you break through one barrier, yes, there's always more to go, right? But it gets easier. And the only thing I can compare that to is this year I recently started CrossFit and like in the initial, I'd never used a barbell before, right? And so like initially I was just trying to figure out like how to hold the barbell. <laughs> Cause that was uncomfortable. Then you add a few weights and you add a few more weights and finally, you know, you're getting comfortable with it, but there's always further to go, right? There's always more weights that can be added, but it feels a little bit different, right? It's still, it's like, okay, I've done this move before I could do the move. Is it harder this time? Because I'm lifting so much more a hundred percent, but like I've been in this feeling and I can push through it. I think that is like such wonderful advice for anyone, but particularly women in a place where you're going to feel uncomfortable a lot of times, especially as you're breaking barriers and, and leading. And so I think that is just such a great thing to keep in mind is get comfortable with that uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So before we wrap up today, we always like to have some fun on the podcast, do some rapid fire questions. It's probably one of my favorite parts of the episode, but I like to give people a little mindset shift and warning. So if you're ready, we can jump into the rapid fire questions. That sounds great. All right. What song, podcast, or book can you not put down right now? Um, Book-wise, I'm currently reading... Uh, qualified sales leader, which is really good. Um, it is helped me a lot in terms of understanding and learning how people have successfully set up kind of well-oiled machines around the sales process. And, and, you know, that's been kind of a fascinating thing to learn. Um, podcast wise, 
Uh, I've been recently on the kick of All In Podcast, which I just love because I love the I love debate. I love when people debate. It is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and just kind of stretching your your own belief system and thoughts. And I like how they, you know, um, take two sides of a different argument and kind of beat it up. And I think that that's so important. And and so so I've been kind of obsessed with that a little bit lately. Oh my God. I think we just became best friends. Cause like I am religious, <laughs> like cannot wait. Like the second it drops, I'm like, Oh my God, it's out. Like me and my fiance, we text each other. We're like, who's going to listen to it first. I completely agree. So double down on the recommendation for the all in pod for everybody. All right. Favorite place you've traveled. Well, I just got back from Grand Cayman. And so I'm a big diver. Um, I'm a big scuba diver and my boyfriend and I, uh, love it. And so any place that has really good diving, I am obsessed. So it was actually some of the best diving I've, I've ever done. The visibility was incredible. There was a lot of cool stuff to see. The island was beautiful. Um, so it's definitely up there because of the diving. (laughs) Happiness is. Mm, it's a hard one. Happiness is, um, I think peace. Like I, whenever I think of happiness, I think the happiest times in my life have been when, when it's been, when I've been able to create peace for myself. In the next five years, I hope to. Hmm. Next five years. Um, I'd hope to see Align AI thriving, growing, <laughs> doing really well. Um, personally, I'd, I'd also hope to get a, a, a stricter kind of health regimen in place around just mental health, physical health, everything. Start establishing some of those really heavy like habits now. Um, so that's what I would love to do in the next five years. To me, curiosity is. Mm. Curiosity to me is essential. Um, Without it, I think parts of us kind of die inside. And I think it's a very critical element of of happiness too, is just being curious and, and playful. There's like this element of your childhood that was just endlessly curious and interested and as we get older we just have to hang on to that i couldn't agree more well that is a perfect place for us to wrap up today's episode thank you thank you so much for coming on the show i know we'll add all your social links and align ai and women in analytics to the show notes Um, but what's the best way for people to stay in touch with you i I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'm on it all the time. You can message me there, um, connect with me there. I've also recently started getting more active in Twitter, like in the last like three months or so. Um, so my tweets are still terrible, but you know, feel free to follow me there too. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry I feel you. If I'm someone sorry. could. T- if someone could teach me what Twitter's about, I would love that. Definitely ping me because I, I feel like I don't get it yet. And I've been using it for 10 years. So <laughs> Yeah, same. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on the show. Wishing you much success in 2023. And definitely we'll be pinging you now to recap some of the All In Pod episodes. So good. Good. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It was really fun talking to you today. And a big thank you to all our listeners. Remember to stay curious and keep learning and we will catch you next time. If you enjoyed today's conversation on the Data Bytes podcast, we welcome you to continue the conversation and join our global community by becoming a member at womenindata.org. 